Good morning or afternoon from wherever you are today. I'm Stacy Rafalowski and I'm the program director for Earth Echo International. And we're so excited to have classrooms from all over the globe joining today, us today. Stacy Rafalowski and I'm the Apologies for that. We had some feedback on there. I think I've got that taken care of, but we're excited to have classrooms joining us today for a really exciting event. Um, we've got a live virtual field trip, uh, the ROV Sebastian in action. Uh, we're joined by a number of different folks uh, that will be up on your screen today. So I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping really quickly uh, so people know kind of how to view this event. Um, the best thing that we can have are questions from the audience. So we've got a number of different ways that we can get questions from the audience. So you can either, if you're watching on Earth Echo's website, there's a form for questions just beneath Earth Echo's, um, the screen where you can view the event today, where you see the live feed coming through. If you're not on Earth Echo's website and you're on our YouTube watch page, then to just to the right of that screen, you'll see a live chat feature as well. So either place you can enter your questions. We're happy to answer your questions and we'll pause throughout this event today that'll take about 40 minutes or so, uh, where you can ask questions and get some information from the scientists on the research vessel Falcor. So, if you do have questions prepared, go ahead, post those questions now or at any point. Also, if you're watching on our website and you want a larger view, especially if you have um, some sort of smart board, then you can enlarge and do a full screen version of the live feed right now. So um, first, I wanted to welcome our classrooms really quickly. We've got three classrooms. Uh, we've got Ms. Farkas's class from Michigan, and I think you guys are to our far left, so I'm going to... We've got Ms. Farkas's class there. You guys can wave. And then we also have Mr. Muller's class who are from New York. We've got them right there. And then finally, they joined us earlier today. We have um, Miss Kendall's class and these guys are coming from Washington. So, hey guys. So welcome to all of our classrooms. We're excited to hear your questions in just a little while. And joining us live from the Falcor, we have research professor Bill Chadwick and the team of researchers there, as well as film, filmmaker and multimedia journal, journalist Tom Hoffman, who's going to be helping us. He's joined the research team for this cruise. Um, and we also have Schmidt Ocean Institute's Carly Wiener. She's helping us manage the technology that makes it possible for you guys to connect. We've got Carly hidden behind the screen right now. She's um, in charge of a PowerPoint. But uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute does some amazing work to advance oceanographic research, discovery, and knowledge. And we're really fortunate to have this work going on with Schmidt Ocean Institute um, to share that, that mission together. So uh, for those of you that don't know, this is not the first time that the FALCOR um, has been in this area of the ocean doing this research. The ship has returned with this team to expand on some findings made here um, one of the most extreme locations on our planet. Uh, so I'm going to ask Bill if you could get us started and give our classrooms a little more information about where you all are and kind of what the focus, what you guys are doing. And I think Carly's going to run some PowerPoint for us. Falcor, I think you guys are muted. Okay, can you hear me now? We can hear you now. Okay. We can hear you now. Very good. Uh, so I'm Bill Chadwick from Oregon State University. Um, I'll just give you a little intro on uh, where we are and what we're doing. Um, so Carly, you can go ahead with the first sli slide. <clears throat> See if we can do this as we reflect on how amazing it is that we can talk to you from a ship in the middle of the Pacific via satellite to places all over the world. That's kind of mind boggling in itself. Oh, let's see. So do you guys see the, the uh, searching for life in the Mariana slide? I'm not hearing anything back. Do you guys see the first slide? 
Yes, we, we do. do. We do. Okay, good. Classrooms, give us a nod. All right. All right, here we go. All right, so um, this is the uh, from the Schmidt website where you can follow along with us. And jumping to the second slide shows us where in the world we are. Um, in the upper right is a picture of the globe. As soon as we get here, there we go. Upper right is a picture of the globe as if we were an astronaut out in space looking at the Earth uh, and if we were able to see through the water also. So you guys are in North America, which is in the upper right. And uh, we're looking at the big Pacific Ocean. And the arrow points to where we are in the Western Pacific. We're north of Guam, south of Japan in the Mariana region. And the reason why we're here is uh, because there is a lot going on here. Um, for a geologist thinking about the Earth, um, the most active places on Earth are where uh, there's tectonic plate boundaries. So almost all the big earthquakes and all the active volcanoes are, are along plate boundaries. <clears throat> and in the Mariana region, there's two different kinds uh, in a very small place. So that's one reason that attracted us. So, so, Carly, I don't think oh. we're advancing the slides quite as quickly. Do we have, are, are we having some, we can do it on at Falcor. We can focus, there we go. Which, yeah, okay, okay. I'm so we switch to, it's just a delay. Okay, let, let me, um, let's see, is it easier to do it from Falcor? Maybe so. We'll, tr we'll try that. Okay, we'll give it a shot. Um, all right, so. So in the Mariana, there's the deep trench. That's where two plates are converging. Uh, that's the deepest part of the ocean. We're actually not, we're working near there, but not in the trench. We're um, working in two different uh, areas where there's active volcanoes, the arc and the back arc. And uh, the arc is from, is formed from the, where the plates are converging and the back arc is where plates are spreading. So there's two different environments. And jumping to the next slide. Thank you, Tom. Um, and wherever there's volcanic activity in the oceans, there's also seafloor hot springs or hydrothermal vents. And uh, the way that works is there's molten rock underground. Water seeps in through the ocean crust, gets heated up. Uh, when that happens, it also dissolves lots of elements out of the rocks that it's traveling through. And then it comes back up to the seafloor chock full of elements and minerals and really hot because of the high pressure. And uh, those hot springs form uh, black smokers like on the right in some cases. And what's really amazing is that sustains life. And I'm going to let Julie explain how that works. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Julie Huber. I'm a scientist out on here, here on the Falcor. Um, and I'm out here from Massachusetts. And one of the really cool things that happens at the bottom of the ocean in these hydrothermal systems is that you have a totally new way of supporting life. So you guys are all living in the surface world. I see you have window shades pulled to block out the sunlight. And up uh, in the surface world, as shown on the left here, you have a photosynthetic food chain, right? Where plants get light um, and use that as energy to fix CO2 and make both oxygen and carbon. But at the bottom of the ocean where we have these hydrothermal hot springs, there are microorganisms instead of plants. So single cell bacteria and archaea, those are single-celled organisms, and what they do is they fix chemical energy to make carbon, and that's called chemosynthesis as opposed to photosynthesis. And the result of that is you have a bunch of carbon and then you can build these higher ecosystems. And so in a lot of the sites we're looking at, we're seeing things like what you see on the right. We're seeing crabs, snails, um, <laughs> limpets, barnacles, mussels, um, squat lobsters, anemones, all sorts of scale worms. Um, and the discovery of hydrothermal hot springs and chemosynthesis um, is a relatively new discovery. It's only about 40 years old, and we're still trying to understand how these ecosystems work. Right. So that's, uh, that's what we're doing. So next slide. Uh, so as um, Stacy said, we're, uh, we had a research expedition out here a year ago on Falcor 
And uh, that was kind of the first phase of this two-year study, and now we're back. So last year, uh, we were exploring a, a big section of the back arc that hadn't been explored before, looking for where uh, new hydrothermal vents might be, because we don't know where they all are until we look. Um, and so we were covering a big area, looking for um, warm water, cloudy water, chemical-rich water above the seafloor, uh, that would be evidence that there was a vent on the bottom. Uh, so we used uh, sensors that we lowered down from the ship. Also, this uh, autonomous underwater vehicle called Sentry that you can see in the lower um, left. And we discovered uh, four new sites. And so this year, we're back uh, with the Falcor um, with its new remotely operated vehicle named Sebastian. And now we can go all the way to the seafloor uh, with lights and cameras and arms. We can we can search around, find the those vents on the seafloor, and uh, do a bunch of sampling. See what kind of chemicals are coming out. See what animals are living there. Uh, I'm really interested in how these new sites compare to sites that are known. How the sites in the back arc compare with the arc, and how and how they compare with sites all around the world. Uh, and the last slide is just shows you the control room on the ship. So the Sebastian is a robotic vehicle. So nobody inside. It's just a machine, but a very complicated, sophisticated, capable machine. It gets lowered down uh, on a cable from the ship, and it's all controlled in a room on the ship that you see there. Lots of screens, lots of lights and cameras on the vehicle, and uh, there's pilots in there operating and and uh, scientists. Uh, asking them politely to, to do things for us, like uh, taking samples or um, putting out instruments. OK, so uh, let's see. That's my intro. So Thanks, what's next, Joe. Stacey? There are a few different questions that have already come in while you were talking. Um, so I think one that is that was one of the first ones that came through is from Grace in Ms. Mul Mr. Muller's class. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask, but you guys can ask questions as well when, um, you know, if you guys want to stand up and ask a question, just come come near to the camera and we'll call you guys. But uh, Grace asked, how do you know that Sebastian won't do harm on the on the seafloor? So are there any concerns about there being disturbance or anything going wrong? Um, we, Sebastian... Um, Kind of hovers above the seafloor most of the time it, unless mm -hmm. we're sampling and then we set down so it's pretty low impact and wherever we're collecting samples we uh try to be careful about you know uh, having a minimal footprint uh, sure. on the seafloor so that's generally not a problem i think we're usually uh worried more about harm to Sebastian because <laughs> it's going down to the bottom of the ocean and the depths here are three or four thousand meters deep so that's like 12 13 14 thousand feet deep a lot of pressure seawater can be corrosive we have to worry about leaks in in you know it's it's kind of amazing every time the vehicle goes to the bottom of the ocean and everything's working um, maybe so we've got uh, uh, John Dunn here, who's the ROV manager. So I'll, I'll pass that over to him in case he wants to comment. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, Sebastian was built um, for this purpose. Uh, a couple of systems in mind. We use hydraulic oil and hydraulic pressure to drive it, the sub around. Uh, the oil is biodegradable. So that is one way in case we do have an issue, we minimize our impact there. Uh, we do everything we can to keep all the oil on the inside and all the electricity on the inside, which usually lets Sebastian come back up. So um, every time it goes down, uh, I'm personally worried about it coming back um, and making sure that my pilots don't bump into anything that's incredibly important uh, sure. and uh, minimizing our impact as we go around. Okay, fantastic. Well, I've got one more question really quickly before um, we go to some of the classrooms, and it's... Uh, was at, it was asked how big, and actually I'm gonna hold that, it's how big is Sebastian? We'll, we can talk about that in a little bit, but um, why in this, why are there two oxygen sensors on Sebastian? And that was from Miss Kendall's class. 
that had that question. Are there two what? Two Why oxygen there two sensors? Ox was there a was there a comment about that? Um, we'll we'll clarify. Know. We can clarify that one. Again. Yeah, oh well, we do have two, right? We have one in this. We have one that's sensing the water column around us. It's just on up top on the vehicle. And then we have one um, on a temperature wand that we stick into these venting fluids. So the one that we stick into venting fluids is measuring um, oxygen at warm temperatures. Um, and it's you have to put it out there and turn a pump on, whereas the one sitting back up on the vehicle, um, it's constantly measuring the oxygen concentration in the water column. And the reason oxygen is interesting is because you guys need oxygen, right? And there's actually a lot of oxygen in the deep ocean. Um, but in these really hot reducing hydrothermal fluids, oxygen starts going away. And it's sort of an indicator of hydrothermal activity, which is why we measure it two different ways. Okay. That was a that was a well prepared question. Um, so I'm going to go to let's start with Miss Farkas's class and let's see what question we have there. You guys need to unmute before you talk, though. Go ahead. A little bit loud. A little bit louder. Can you put the mic a little closer? Okay, say it one more time, and I can kind of hear you, but it's hard to hear. One more time. Um, I was wondering about the small right, white craft that we saw earlier on the PowerPoint, and um, if their color could have come from their diet or what they eat. Okay, so the question is about the crabs that were in the PowerPoint and that they were white. And why, where did they get that white coloration? Is that the question? Is it from diet or something that they process? Okay. So Falcor? Uh, I don't think it comes from any particular place. You know, crabs are, can be different colors. Um, these ones happen to be white. We, we do see that um, I think their, their uh, shells can get colored uh, the longer they have them. So, so crabs molt, so they, because they, their bodies grow, but their shell can't, right? So they, as they grow, they periodically have to shed their shell and grow a new one. So the, the ones that have molted recently, I think are the brightest white and the ones that have um, had their shell longer can be a little bit uh, yellow or orange. Do I have that right, Julie? Yeah. I guess I would just add, remember that at the bottom of the ocean at these depths, there's no light ever. Sebastian is creating a false environment by shining lights down there so we can do our work. These organisms, they don't see each other the way you and I see each other. They're using mainly chemical and heat sensing, um, whether it's little hairs on their legs in the case of the crabs or, um, you know, like with the shrimp sort of. Uh, seeking these chemical gradients and things like that. So in most of these animals, colors don't actually, they don't even matter because they can't see each other. Yeah, that's interesting. I have to remember that the normal environment is pitch black down there, yeah. So I think I saw a question with Mr. Muller's class. Was there somebody that had a question there? Okay, go right ahead. Um, Hi, I'm Emily. I would like to ask um, what first caused you to want to study this subject? So what made them want to look at hydrothermal vents? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Could you repeat the question, Stacey? She's, yeah, she's asking what is it that made you want to go into this field of study, um, vent research, deep sea research? Right. That's a great question. Uh, so I'm a geologist. Uh, I'm really interested in volcanoes and how they work. And uh, I guess what got me interested in that is uh, when, when I was in college, Mount St. Helens erupted in Washington State. And I was in Colorado and some ash from Mount St. Helens fell in Colorado. And that was seemed really amazing to me. And I, uh, I decided to go out there and volunteer for a couple of weeks with the U.S. Geological Survey. And before I knew it, I was flying in a helicopter into the crater. And I just thought that was the most exciting thing. And uh, so I just kept doing it. And uh, it's been fun ever since. How about you, Julie? 
Uh, I always wanted to study the ocean since I was really, really little, like four. Um, but what attracted me to deep sea science was sort of um, the parallels between space exploration and understanding life on our own planet. And um, there was this big paper that came out that said there was evidence for life on Mars. And all of that life was microbial. And um, it turned out to completely be wrong. Um, it's part of the scientific process. You put your data out there and then sometimes you get proven wrong. Um, but it, it really kind of captured my imagination thinking about um, using understanding systems on Earth from this very remote perspective, which is really what we're doing. We cannot uh, physically travel to the seafloor and even if we could in a submarine, um, it's just incredibly limiting what you can learn um, in just one or two trips, very similar to what we do up in space, which is why it's it's great to have longer expeditions where we can go back over and over again to understand them. Yeah, why do you study underwater volcanoes, John? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a little bit of a di different case. I'm a marine engineer, um, and I get to keep Sebastian running and then tag along on these uh, projects. So <clears throat> um, I think that I get to bear witness more than uh, study anything. So why, why did you become an engineer? Oh, well... Um, I got into marine engineering uh, because of my grandfather uh, and his father before him, I guess. A family of marine engineers that all went to uh, maritime academies. Um, before this, I, got, I was a ship's engineer and then got fascinated by um, ROVs and remote submarines and keeping them running, and here I am today. I think for most scientists, the main motivation is curiosity. So we, we each have different specialties, but... Uh, at the core of it, I think, is just um, being trying to answer questions that, that seem uh, interesting or important, and um, and then thinking about how to answer those questions. Uh, the, that's those are great answers, everybody. And I know we we have Tom as well. I think somewhere there, and and. Would love to get his perspective it, as somebody who comes from a little bit of a non-science background. And then we have a question from okay, Kenna here's Tom. as well. So, um, Hi, everyone. Yeah, so my name's Tom, and I'm a filmmaker, multimedia person. And uh, yeah, I studied science communication, so how to try and make science accessible to different groups of people. I originally studied psychology many years ago, and yeah, I really love telling stories about science. I think there's lots of exciting developments, and um, it's just an exciting way to look at the world. And as you can see from the trip that people are out here, we've got scientists that are working in a really unusual environment. You might not expect scientists to be working in a place like this. I've also followed researchers to Mount Everest. There's lots of great stories happening everywhere, and so that's kind of why I got driven to to work in science communication and uh, yeah it's great fun they're all very nice scientists are really friendly you can ask them questions and they just tell you what's going on so uh, yeah Tom Thanks. is keeping our online blog going and uh, making the video clips that are online so he's he's been great he's his job is making us look good I, I think most of the folks that are watching today have, have gotten to see some of Tom's Tom's work and uh, prior to getting on the hangout today. So Kenna had a question and she is standing right now in Miss Kendall's class, but she can't get, um, we can't get the mics to work. So she wanted to know um, about chemo chemosynthesis and in the transformation of uh, with organic matter, why is there chemical energy instead of photosynthesis? And I think Julie answered or, or led into the answer for this question, but why is it chemosynthetic instead of photosynthetic down there? Right, so the most simple explanation is that there's no light. So there, you know, light only penetrates a few hundred meters into the ocean. And so at, um, most of the organisms living in the deep ocean are using a kind of rain of organic carbon that comes from photosynthetic life at the surface. And so what does that mean? That means at the bottom of the ocean, there's very little food in many cases. And so it's kind of slow. However, at these hot springs, they're really oases of life because you have all this chemical energy coming out of the volcano. So Bill kind of showed that schematic of seawater entering the crust. And what happens when that seawater gets heated up 
is it picks up a lot of these really delicious food sources for bacteria. Now, they sounds super gross to you and me because they're things like hydrogen sulfide, iron, manganese, hydrogen. But these are things microbes can use as chemical energy and make carbon. And so the reason chemosynthesis happens is because life has this amazing way of almost always exploiting energy. It almost always uses it. It's hard to find a place on earth where there is no life, particularly microbial life. Um, and so that's why. Right. So as a geologist, I think of the microbes as doing little chemical reactions that release energy. And uh, it seems like every possible reaction that could yield energy, there's some microbe doing it somewhere, which is really amazing. So wanted to check in. I know, Tom, you were hoping to take us out on the deck. Is that going to be a possibility today or maybe not? No, I think our bandwidth doesn't allow it. It, it just okay. doesn't work very well. Okay. Yes. Okay, then um, what I want to do is go ahead and uh, move into some questions. We've got a lot of questions about Sebastian, so um, I was going to hold them until uh, we were there, but uh, I think it's good to go ahead and ask some of those now. So we have a couple of questions uh, about how big is Sebastian? So. 6,000 pounds, just under seven. <laughs> uh, Sebastian weighs about just under 7,000 pounds. Uh, it's roughly 10 feet long, 10 feet wide, 8 feet tall when it's sitting on the deck. Okay, and that, that was, that was a, a Landon from Edgemont, South Dakota that asked that. And also we have Alexis uh, who wanted to know, how does Sebastian not collapse under pressure? How do you keep Sebastian from collapsing? That's a great question. Um, so Sebastian's made up of a lot of different components. The big yellow foam is a, a syntactic foam. So it looks like a giant block, but it's what it's actually made up of, of billions of micro balloons of glass. Um, they build different types. So Sebastian is foam is built to withstand about an ocean depth of uh, 5,000 meters, so uh, roughly 15,000 feet. Um, the spheres are so t packed tightly together that when the water compresses them, they can't really move anymore. Um, the frame is built of aluminum, uh, which in itself is incompressible. Um, we have several different compartments around that we use, we pump oil into, uh, liquid being non-compressible. Under pressure, um, it keeps the enclosures where all our electrical connections from imploding under the pressure. And then we have two titanium cans that are one atmosphere can so inside that we have surface pressure but the titanium enclosures are so strong that they can withstand the pressure of um, the ocean depth that Sebastian's built for all right great answers so um, we had a couple of questions about the size of Sebastian and what, what someone wants to know let's see miss Austinson's class in South Dakota wants to know what happens if a shark or a large creature runs into Sebastian. <laughs> um, well, not a lot. Um, Sebastian's <laughs> pretty strong. Um, I guess it would have to be a really big shark. Uh, and then if we got into a fight, we've got two tiny titanium arms we could fight back with. Um, but generally speaking, we're, we're really loud compared to the surrounding ocean um, as far as sea animals go. So some animals are curious. They like the light. Some animals are not. The bigger ones tend to stay away from us so far. Um, we keep hoping to see a big octopus or a big shark somewhere, but nothing yet. Okay, I'm going to go back through the classrooms here if you guys are, are cool with answering questions from our students um, because we really have a lot of questions. <laughs> so um, I'm going to go back to Ms. Farkas's class, and we'll do a question, and then we'll just kind of roll through. So you guys unmute, and let's see what you got. Speak loudly. What are the claws on the front for? So the robotic arms that he was just mentioning, what are they for? Okay. So did you guys get that? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did. So the two arms in the front are two um, shilling manipulators. They're T4s. They're made of titanium. Um, 
<clears throat> there's seven functions. So we use those for sampling. We can move them mostly like a human arm, and actually we get a little more articulation than a human arm. We are able to grab various tools and use those for sampling or picking up rocks. Um, we have a, a vacuum cleaner looking thing that we try to suck up snails with and shrimp that's working pretty well. We have uh, little metal scoops and um, also we use it to grab um, the, the suction sampler or the uh, hot fluid sampler. So we use those as just like you use your own arms but down low to, to grab onto things and try not to crush things. Um, that's what they're for. They're great tools to, to sample the environment we're in. All right. So let's see. Ms. Kendall's class has Adam there. And so Adam's question is, what other kinds of things has Sebastian discovered? Or what other kinds of environments have you guys had Sebastian in besides the vent systems? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this is actually Sebastian's first scientific crew so this is our we're we're really excited to to actually get to work um the the previous we're on dive 40 our previous 32 dives were all testing phase we we're actually out in this area but nothing this cool um we've done a bunch of sandy bottom work off of guam not a lot to see but we were really testing sebastian to make sure that it could do the work that we are advertising so to speak um but this is the first time we've actually gotten to go out and see anything really cool with Sebastian. And I, I just want to build off of that because we had another question from Riverside High School from Robert and he asked, what happens if Sebastian breaks down underwater? <laughs> that is everybody's uh, Everybody cries. <laughs> yeah. Well, I start to cry. Um, <laughs> it depends. Uh, we have a lot of gear on board Sebastian to kind of tell us what the problem is. Um, being a new ROV, there's always some little glitch we're trying to work around. Uh, if we can't fix it and the sub's still alive, uh, we can still see out the cameras and we can maneuver, then we'll generally come back up. If we have a total failure um, and the lights go out on Sebastian and we can't see anymore, then the umbilical, the cable that it's attached to, if you look behind me, we do have the ability to, to pull that back up. We generally don't pull Sebastian back up. We let him fly and pull the cable up at the same time, but we could pull him up. Um, and that's our, our worst case scenario, I suppose. Okay, I think Kate in Mr. Muller's class has a question that's that's related to that as well. Kate or, or Billy, whoever is there, you guys go ahead and ask your questions. Need you to unmute really quickly. There you go. Kate, look at the camera, you gotta move the, uh, yeah, there you go. With the camera oh, um, hi, I'm Kate, and I was wondering, uh, since Sebastian is so heavy, how it moves from place to place. Uh, that's a great question. So Sebastian weighs 6,000 or almost 7,000 pounds in air, but that giant foam block on top, once we land in the water, we actually become neutrally buoyant. So um, if you think about wearing a life jacket, that's kind of what the foam does. So it makes Sebastian... Well, just a little bit positively buoyant and we trim it that way so that it, if the lights go out she starts to float up but um, the air weight compared to the water weight is quite a difference it actually weighs just about 30 pounds in water compared to 7,000 pounds in air and of course uh, if we want to move around with Sebastian we have to move the ship because the Sebastian's attached to the ship so it's sort of a chore choreographed dance that we have to do if we want to move over there we have to ask the ship to move and then Sebastian moves at the same time go ahead and Billy did you have a question <laughs> yeah um have you ever found anything from the past or like human objects under the water like archaeological finds instead of biological stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the places we work generally don't have much stuff like that. Although we, if we're working in sites that have been visited before by maybe another ROV or submersible, sometimes we find things left behind by them. Like uh, a few days ago, we found 
some dive weights from the Alvin submersible uh, from dives that were made in 1987 at, at the site we were diving at. So that, that was kind of amazing. But generally, we don't find too much uh, that's been left behind. Right. I was just going to add, and it sort of builds on John's comment, that scientific ROVs are used for all sorts of things. This is just one example. But there are ROVs that specialize, for example, in looking for wrecks. Um, um, Dr. Bob Ballard has really led that effort. Um, but ROVs can be used up in the water column to capture like all those weird jellies and other creatures and fish that you sometimes can see on the Discovery Channel. So it's not even on the bottom, it's just hovering in the water column. They can be used to make maps. They can be used to explore methane seeps or where there's oil coming out of the seafloor. Um, there's a, a lot of things you can do with a scientific ROV. Okay, so I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask just a couple of questions really quickly that we're getting from viewers that aren't on camera with us. So um, Fairmont School, uh, we've got a student named John who is asking, have you found or classified any new species in the area? Um, and what, what are they if there are things that you would categorize as a new species? Well, our card-carrying animal biologist is asleep, um, but she has been working, her name's Farina Tonnecliffe, she's been working out in this area for about 15 years now, right? And uh, when we first started doing dives here over a decade ago, yes, I mean, almost everything we found was a new species. Um, and one of the goals of Rena's work out here is to look at these new sites that we're diving at and to compare it what she's learned over the last decade. And I know last night she was very excited when the samples came up. She, she's like, this is a new snail. This, this is a new snail. You know, she had just by looking at it, she had convinced herself. But then what, when we get back on shore, a group of scientists who specialize, for example, in marine invertebrates, will look at the organisms very carefully, look at their DNA. Um, but, you know, the pace of discovery in these environments is very high because they are so um, unexplored. And actually, I would say that's true for most of the ocean. So I'm going to jump in and ask you guys a question really quickly. Um, our our uh, founder, Philippe Cousteau, uh, participated in a panel just recently on space versus ocean for exploration. And um, which which would you guys say is more important to explore? I think I know the answer, but <laughs> but could you tell us why, or could you tell our, our our audience why? Well, I will say I get a good bit of funding from NASA, and the reason NASA comes to an oceanographer, a deep sea oceanographer like me, is because you know what we're doing here is a lot like what NASA wants to do. Um, for example, on Mars or on Jupiter's moon Europa or Saturn's moon Enceladus, where we think there are salty oceans. Basically, how do you look for life in such a hostile place, right? You look for chemical signatures, you look for, is there um, tectonics going on, things like that. And so I always tell the NASA engineers, if you can't run that instrument at the bottom of the ocean, don't bother sending it um, on this seven-year journey, right, to, to, to Jupiter's moon Europa, um, because it's really harsh at the bottom of Earth's ocean. I think, um, you know, we live on planet Earth. This is our only ocean, covers 70% of the surface of our planet, and we don't get it. You know, we don't understand huge swaths of it and how it works. And volcanism is a perfect example where 70% of the volcanism on our planet, it's underwater. It's been going on for 4 billion years. Yet here we are still making really primary discoveries. So I'm not going to choose a side. I think both are awesome and exciting. Um, but we're here on planet ocean right now. Great answer. Nice okay. answer. <laughs> Nice answer. Okay. Well, what we'll do if, if nobody else wants to jump in on that one is we'll let the classrooms ask a couple more questions. I know you guys have a lot of questions, but we're, we're probably not going to be able to get to all of them in the interest of time. We've only got about two more minutes. So let's start with Ms. Farkas and we'll do one more question there and we'll just go through again. So can we unmute Ms. Farkas's class? Go ahead. Um, hello, my name is Brody Griffin, and the 
question I wanted to ask you is, how long did it take you guys to build Sebastian? And how much did it cost? So the question is, how long did it take to develop and build Sebastian? And what was the total cost? All right. <laughs> um, actually, Sebastian was designed and built in about a 14 time period from uh, start to finish. Uh, that's pretty rapid for any program to come together that quickly. But the, the engineers were given a goal and a challenge and uh, were able to meet it. Um, pretty impressively and uh, to date we're working really well um, out of the box so the other piece of it I really um, can't answer but uh, it was a big number <laughs> I don't know the answer but other ROVs like this have cost about five million dollars so that's probably the the ballpark figure so they're you know they're really high technology really uh, capable you know, vehicles that are capable of operating in this extreme environment. So they're uh, very sophisticated and uh, that, that costs money. All right, so let's go to Ms. Kendall's class. We have Ella standing there in Ms. Kendall's class. Her question was, she was wondering why events are so important to like the global ecosystem, like why are, are, do you mean the vents themselves, how important they are to the ecosystem around them or why vents are important in the world? Okay, so why the vent itself is important to the ecosystem around it. Yes, oh, I, okay. Ella wants to know why the vent itself is important to the ecosystem around it. Okay. Thanks, Ella. Right, so when we were talking about the difference between photosynthesis and chemosynthesis earlier, I was saying that, you know, there's no light in the deep ocean and so at vents the connection between the vent itself these hot warm fluids filled with things like hydrogen sulfide and hydrogen and iron that are coming out of the seafloor they are what is supporting the ecosystem so i mean it is an absolute coupling between the geochemical energy and the ecosystem and actually our last couple dives have been at sites that they look like they're dying. Um, 20 years ago when dives were made here, they were higher temperature. And um, we have found a lot of structures that there's no animals on them and they're dead. Um, in a geochemical sense, they're dead. There's no more venting fluid coming out. And as soon as that shuts down, the animals, they, they go away um, because they have to be within the venting fluid area um, to survive. And then that brings in like, things like crabs and octopus and other kind of secondary predators. So it's, it's a super tight coupling. Okay, and in the interest of time, I just want to give Mr. Muller's class a quick opportunity to ask a question or two. I know everybody needs to go, so um, I, I want to give you guys a chance. Just unmute you're real on. quick. Yep, you're on. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, yes. I was wondering, um, how fast can Sebastian go in miles per hour? Yeah, great question. Um, down at the bottom of the ocean, we can probably go just under um, 1.2 uh, miles per hour, but we generally don't get going much more than about that half a mile an hour um, for a lot of reasons, but mostly because there's a lot to take in at that speed, and we don't want to bump into anything. Okay, they had already also asked, um, how long can you can Sebastian be deployed for? Yeah, yeah. that was my uh, question. The, yeah, designed and built, um, Sebastian itself doesn't really have any endurance limits as long as the systems keep working. Um, if we have. Pilots on board will we'll staff for 24 hours if the project demands it. So theoretically, we could keep going uh, days at a time, um, depending on weather and if we can keep everybody awake. Yeah, I would just add that Bill and I have done some ROV dives with different vehicles that have lasted like five or six days. Um, so that's one of the great things about an ROV, that there's no people inside of it and it has unlimited power from the ship. So. You can just keep going and going. As long as you want, and everything's working, yeah. But we need to sleep. 
sleeping is good. So I'm, I'm going to close this out with one more question that um, came from Randleman High, and that was, do you consider the biodiversity in the area around the vents to be higher or lower than other parts of the ocean? So in the deep ocean, the biodiversity at vents is much higher than the surrounding deep ocean. And in fact, if you were to kind of put all the vents in the world that we know about together, their biodiversity rivals that of a coral reef. Um, but what's really interesting about the biodiversity of these systems is you don't always, you find different things at different places. And we're trying to understand why is that, what controls the distribution? Um, you know, why do you see some worm in the North Pacific and then a different type of worm in the mid middle Pacific or East Pacific. And so um, those are some of the questions we're trying to answer, but absolutely these are hot spots of um, biodiversity in the deep ocean, which is yet another reason they're so exciting to study. All right. Well, everybody, we're losing some of our classrooms and we have run completely out of time. We have not run out of questions. So um, I will send questions along and see if we can get those answered uh, a, a little bit later. And I will post those back on the same page as people are viewing uh, this live event today. But I want to thank our classrooms. Uh, I want to thank our scientists. Thanks for getting up so early and, and joining us today. We had great questions. You guys had great answers. Um, and I want to thank Schmidt Ocean Institute uh, for helping us and partnering with us to do this today. I want to make sure to tell everybody watching, be sure to visit SchmidtOcean.org and EarthEcho.org uh, for more resources around this and, and different content that you might be interested in. And also, I know that a lot of people tuned in and they were excited about seeing some of the, the dives and the live feeds uh, and learning more about that. And what we would advise that everybody do is uh, make sure to like and connect with uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute and Earth Echo, um, but most particularly Schmidt Ocean Institute uh, around the live feeds on their social media channels at Schmidt Ocean. Um, and we'll post this on the site after we're done with the live feed. And also hashtag hydrothermal hunt has been really cool. I've watched some of the live feeds. I've loved some of the clips that Tom has pulled out. Um, there's some really fun stuff there. Everybody go check it out. Take a look. And um, we will see you next time. And thanks, everybody, for all you did today. Bye. Have a great time. Bye. 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 Hey, we're going to have day. a great dive today, so tune in in a few hours. What time is that dive, Bill? We're going in in about an hour or so, and then it'll be two hours to the bottom, so okay. three or four hours from now. All right, about three or four hours from now. You guys can check it out. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Bye. 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 <laughs> <laughs>